So I just mentioned a second ago that figuring out what the correct adjustments are for blind versus blind strategy is important because it's a spot that you'll find yourself in a lot for six max. But how much is a lot? Or what does a lot really mean? Well, according to Tom Chambers' book, Advanced PLO Theory, you'll find yourself in a blind versus blind spot approximately 2.5% of the time. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but think about it for a second. That's about 25 times for every 1,000 hands you play. So if you can pick up half of a big blind each time you're blind versus blind against someone, well, that's going to add over a buy-in to your win rate for every 10,000 hands you play. Now, there's a lot of different strategies that can be successful. But what I'm going to do is give you the guidelines that I've found work the best against a variety of opponent types. But I think it's a good idea to take this stuff and use it as a good starting point. And then what you should do is go out there and play around with it a little bit and find out what works best for you. But if you find something juicy that I didn't talk about here, make sure to shoot me an email about it so I can use it, all right? <laughs> Anyways, the first and most important thing to mention about playing blind versus blind is that it's entirely opponent dependent. By now, it's probably obvious that no matter what poker situation you find yourself in, you know, whether it be a tournament, a cash game, full ring or heads up, you should always adjust your line depending on who's in the pot with you. But this is really exaggerated when you're blind versus blind, and you want to treat it almost like you're playing at a heads up table, because, I mean, all things considered, you basically are. And a lot of players I've seen, even the better regs, play very exploitably blind versus blind. So what's the first step to getting our hands on some of this easy money? Well. The first step is to start t taking blind versus blind specific notes for the opponents on the left and right of you. We'll talk more about how to take good notes in the note taking lesson in section 2. But something I want to point out is that with many players, their overall style changes a lot in blind versus blind play. Some will play very nitty, others will open too wide and fold to a lot of 3 bets, and others will really come after you when they have position. Regardless, you need to figure out how they're approaching blind versus blind, and then take notes on it so that you can use the adjustments that we're about to go over in the next slides correctly. For example, a note I might take on someone is that he 3-bets much wider blind versus blind than he does from other positions. Or, an even simpler example, is someone that plays very passively when he's out of position blind versus blind. So, a good starting point for talking about blind versus blind is understanding that a pot size steal risks 2.5 big blinds to win 1.5 big blinds, which means it needs to work 62.5% of the time to be immediately profitable. So, given what I just said, that means we should just open a ton and collect all the dead money from our opponent's folding habits, right? Not so fast. That would be fantastic if people actually folded when you open blind versus blind, but once you start playing some PLO, you'll quickly notice that people don't like folding very much, especially blind versus blind. So how should we adjust our strategy out of the small blind then? Well, what this means is that you should generally start off playing very tight. Unless you're against a weaker player, being out of position with a bunch of money behind to play with won't generate a ton of profit for you in the long run. Remember that the value in our hand has to come from somewhere, whether it be skill advantage, card advantage, or positional advantage, so if you don't have position and you don't have a big skill edge on your opponent, well then you're going to need a strong hand to turn a profit in the long run. But as always, we can adjust our ranges to fit the tendencies of the opponents in the hand. For example, if the big blind's a knit, well then you can open wider because you'll be taking it down so often. Or if the big blind isn't making your life tough pre-flop by 3-betting you a lot, then just adjust your ranges based off of his post-flop tendencies. If he's calling all of your raises pre-flop, then figure out how he's responding to your c-bets. If he's always calling your raises pre-flop and then giving up on a lot of c-bets, well then widening your range against those types of opponents can turn a profit as well because all of all of the dead money you're collecting when you take it down with a c-bet. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So, we touched on a couple of ways you can make adjustments out of the small blind in the last slide, but we mostly just talked about adjusting the nits and weaker players. But on this slide, we're going to focus on several different methods you can use to adjust the lags, because they're the ones that are the hardest to play against, so it's worth spending more time on them, right? Our first option is to just fold more, which truthfully is the most obvious and the one I like the most. Our money isn't going to come from getting ourselves in marginal spots against aggressive players out of position. It's going to come from targeting the weaker players, right? Getting in a spew fest blind versus blind is an easy way to induce variance and tilt. And truthfully, you're not giving up a ton of equity by just folding your small blind to a tough and aggressive player. 
So do yourself a favor, release your ego a bit, and just get used to surrendering the majority of your hands from the worst position at the table. I promise it's not that hard to do once you get the hang of it. Our next option is to limp call hands that play poorly in 3-bet pots out of position, have some post-flop playability, but aren't good enough to 4-bet. And especially against guys who are just 3-betting their nuts off, you can do it with hands like Jack-Jack 10-7 single suited, for example, because these hands like the SPR in single raised pots a lot more than in 3-bet pots when we're out of position. But if you do decide to limp, the key is to not fall into the trap of just check folding every time you miss. To make this profitable, you kind of have to grow some balls, and make sure you're check raising dry flops or boards that don't hit them very often, like paired boards and monotone boards. Because if you're relying on just calling, then making a hand and getting paid, well this option will definitely be negative EV for you, because the money you make when you flop well won't be enough to make up for the times that you have to check fold. Our third option is to 4-bet wider against people who are 3-betting you 15% of more. And this is because if they're doing it that wide, well then they're going to be giving up a lot when you c-bet post-flop, which is profitable because we can pick up a lot of dead money, and if we're 4-betting the right ranges, we can dominate their stack off ranges post-flop as well. If you need a refresher on good hands to 4-bet with, I suggest you review the 4-betting section, which is lesson number 6. Now, 4-betting works well when you're out of position, because you lower the SPR, which, if you remember, makes our life much easier when we're out of position. And honestly, if I'm against a player who's really getting after me with the 3-betting, I don't even open unless I plan on 4-betting in the first place, because I don't want to have to open and fold the 3-bets all the time, mainly because it's a really easy way to bleed money out of your stack. Now, the last option we have is to call the 3-bet and check-raise the flop which is probably the most difficult one to pull off, and truthfully it's my least favorite option of the four, because you're relying on clean board textures and you still have to play out of position. Plus, good players aren't going to see bet every, time, every single time they 3-bet anyway. A lot of times, they'll check back, realize their equity, and play more poker in position, which has equity built into it for them and is an easy way for you to lose money. So, overall, if you're going to use this method, then you should only open a mediocre hand if it hits a lot of flops hard enough to semi-bluff light in 3-bet pots. So avoid opening bad pairs and the more disconnected single suited hands. Alright, so we've talked a lot about what to do if we're out of position, but how should our strategy change when we're in position? Well, our game plan is mainly centered around keeping their soul in a bottle. Now, if you haven't done this already, you should go check out the Full Tilt Store, because they have these things called soul shelves that come with not only a shelf to hold the souls of the players you own at the table, but also these really high quality bottles that help keep the souls warm so they don't spoil from sitting on your shelf forever. I think it's like 100,000 points or something, so if you have enough points, you should definitely try to buy one soon. Nah, I'm just kidding about the soul shelf. But the point I'm trying to get across is that you can really own people when you have position in blind versus blind situations. And the first adjustment you want to make is to simply not fold very much. Now, getting a 2 to 1 price on a pot sized open with the positional advantage is more than enough to play profitably in position against a random opponent in a 6 max online game. But, as always, you need to make sure that you're not just calling an open just for the sake of calling an open. You always need some kind of game plan, and like I've said before, it always starts with figuring out what the tendencies are of your opponents and then making the correct adjustments. For example, if you're playing against someone who's opening 75% of his hands or more, well then you could really own them in the long run by literally playing 100% of hands, and then just destroy them post-flop by floating or raising every single flop, because even someone who's opening the top 50% of hands won't flop good enough to continue against you that often. Again, imagine you're playing someone heads up, except that instead of the player on the button being first to act, the player out of position has to act first. In that kind of scenario, how often would you really fold if you had the button? And remember, all of this is even more exaggerated when you're deep. If I'm more than 150 big blinds deep with someone, it takes a pretty bad hand for me to fold preflop, given that I have the, the positional advantage and a lot of money in the stacks. But, unfortunately, against most opponents, it's not going to be that easy. So what kind of things should we look for then? Well, two things that are good to look for are what their c-betting tendencies are and how often they fold to three bets. And if you don't have any hands or history with them, feel free to feel them out the first couple of times you get blind versus blind. If your hand isn't the greatest, then just call preflop and see what they do postflop. Did he c-bet and check fold the turn? What was his sizing and what was the board like? Did he snap pot it or did he think about it for a while and then bet two thirds? Now, if your hand is good enough to three bet, then be sure to take a note on how he reacted to it. If he folds, or if he calls and check folds, then take note of it and what type of board it was on. If he's folding to a lot of your three bets, or if he's playing very fit or fold in three bet pots, then you should probably three bet him more until he starts to adjust. 
Hey, what's going on guys? Casino Crime here. Now if you like this video and you want more, then go ahead and click the subscribe button below right now. And if you want to join me for more of my 6 Max success secrets and free video tutorials, just click the link to the right. See you inside the trainings. Good luck.